Well, today we're going to talk about life after death. And if you think I'm going to cover the whole thing this morning, you are crazy. <clears throat> this topic is huge and got even bigger as I started working and, and going through it. But what I want to do is I want to approach it in a Q&A kind of way, all right? And I want to uh, dispel some of those strange things that are floating out there relative to life after death. And uh, to start with, I thought I would start where most people start when they think about um, life after death and going to heaven. And that is the question, will we have to go before St. Peter to get into the pearly gates? We all know this, right? Well, one of my favorites is this. Guy finds himself in front of the pearly gates and St. Peter explains to him that it is not so easy to get into heaven. And so he has to ask him some questions. The first is, um, how were you in your religious life on earth? And the man says, well, not real good. So St. Peter says, well, didn't you go to church real regularly? Well, eh, not so much, really. Um, St. Peter told him that's not very good. So St. Peter said, well, you know, what about um, money? Did you give money to the poor? Did you help out people that were struggling uh, financially? And the guy said, uh, no, I really kind of just kept it all to myself and enjoyed life. St. Peter said, that's not so good. Finally, St. Peter said, well, did you do any good deeds? Did you help any neighbors? Anything like that? Anything? And and uh, finally, the guy said, oh, yeah, 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 I did, I did help this little old lady. And St. Peter said, well, tell me more. And he said, she was accosted by a group of hell's angels. And they were just harassing the daylights out of her. Nobody was doing anything. Finally, I stepped in and helped this lady out. And the guy who was the head of hell's angels, I told him how despicable his behavior was. Uh, how he should be embarrassed by the way he treated this woman, and I shoved him out of the way. St. Peter was writing all this down and said, well, when did this happen? And the guy said, uh, about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> okay, we love those St. Peter, pearly gate, heaven jokes, right? Well, I got to admit, in Revelation 21, it does talk, it is revealed uh, to St. John that there are pearly gates. There are gates, actually, that are gigantic, huge pearls that are mentioned. The danger in the St. Peter jokes is this, and it's important for us to hear, and maybe even temper as we tell those jokes, because I think we're transmitting something that's funny, but really we're transmitting something that can be eternally damaging to someone, and that is this. That you got to please St. Peter. You have to have done something good that warrants him writing your name and opening the gate. The reason I say that's damaging is it's false teaching. It's somehow believing that, that we do something that impresses God to get into heaven. And if I hear one more confirmation student respond to the question, how do you get to heaven by saying you got to be good, I am going to pull all the hair out of my head, including my beard. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace, undeserved love, you have been saved through faith, through trust. And this is not your own doing. This is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works so that anyone might boast. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's not through me, not through my works. Not through my attitude. It's only through Christ. And my trust in Him. Your trust in Him. Well, where do we go? Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea, no chaos. And I saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Now I want to share not just scripture and teaching. I want to share with you experiences that I've had in this regard. <clears throat> some, of you, 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 some of you may have heard before, but I want to share them anyway. And that is, this scripture was being read to my dad by my wife as he was dying from a brain tumor. He had a glioblastoma brain tumor that was diagnosed on July 19th, <laughs> George's birthday, and he was dead by November 13th. Week before he died, my wife was reading this, this scripture passage to him. And he had reached the point where talking w was very difficult. Uh, the, the swelling in the brain was just pushing on that ability to talk. And Sherry said that he was just looking at her the whole time she was reading this scripture. And then about halfway, he broke his gaze on her and began looking around the room in our house. Just looking, looking, looking. And it was as if he was in two places at the same time. And then Sherry told me that as she stopped reading, where I stopped reading, my dad said, wow. Now I want you to know what chills me the most about that story. So I knew my dad for 45 years. I never heard the word wow come out of his mouth during those entire 45 years. He experienced something. And God allowed us here to get his emotional response to what he experienced. So what happens when you die? Question. Will you become an angel with wings and a halo and sit on a cloud playing a harp for all of eternity? I don't know about you, but that does not sound like a whole lot of fun. I'm scared of heights. I will be terrified all through eternity if I got to sit on a cloud. Huh? Well, what about this? We have this image, <clears throat> first of all, of angels having wings and halos and come floating down and all that kind of stuff, unless you watch the History Channel then the angels appear as ninjas with two swords that they can slice and dice and all kinds of stuff. I like the History Channel's image of angels actually better than our image that we have in our heads. And part of the reason I say that is the messengers are angels, but we also have this image of angels as warriors fighting a great cosmic battle. Will we become angels? The answer is... No. Angels are angels, and we are people. In 1 Corinthians 6, 3, we, we hear this. Do you not know that we are to judge angels? So there's a separation between us and, and angels. In Hebrews 13, 1, it says, Let brotherly love continue. Don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. So it's almost more that we don't take on wings and halo, but it's almost more like angels can appear in a physical form like human beings. We do not become angels. Question. If we won't be sitting on clouds <clears throat> playing harps as angels... What will we be doing? Revelation 22 says, No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants 
will worship him. A worship service, you ready for this, Paul? A worship service that lasts for eternity. Amen. He like, I like that. Yeah. A worship service that lasts an eternity. How's that emotionally playing on you right now? You're going, I know I should like this, but boy, there's something about it that I just fundamentally, I'm not sure that I like a worship service that goes on forever and just doesn't, I don't know, I got other things I had to do, right? <clears throat> My question is this, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be talking about life after, but I also want us to contextualize where we're at, what we're doing right now. What is it that would cause us to say, I'm not sure I want to worship for all of eternity? Think about that. I mean, just ponder that. You to lay all your reasons out on the table that might make you go, I'm not sure that is something I want to do. And what you will discover is self-distractions get in the way of our worship right here. And we carry that into our thinking about worshiping for all of eternity, right? What if they sing a song I don't like and I got to sing that for the rest of my life? What if there are drums in heaven and I got to listen to those confounded drums for all of eternity? Sorry. Okay. We got, we got an amen from the drummer and that's it. Okay. What if there are pipe organs and all there is is classical music for all of eternity and I can't stand classic? Guess what? It is our tastes that are causing problems in our worship. It appears that in heaven, that's not going to be an issue. Why? There will be no distractions. We won't be thinking about, will I catch the kickoff for the NFL game. We won't be thinking of, man, did I turn the oven on or not? Are we going to have anything to eat when we get out of here? I didn't eat breakfast. My stomach. There's not going to be that distraction. There's not going to be the distraction of, is the worship team standing here or there or wherever, the drums here, there, wherever. It's not going to be a distraction. It's not going to be a personal taste. You know why? What we hear in this passage is really, really important if we want to understand our worship here right now. And that's this. They worship Him. In other words, the total focus is upon God. No distractions, no personal feelings. Just unbridled worship of him. Guys, you know what? I have been in Notre Dame Cathedral. And I have participated in a Latin Mozart mass with a full orchestra and three banks of organs all tied together. And the loudness of that classical music was so intense, I could feel my chair vibrating across the floor. It was in Latin. I didn't understand a single word that was uttered. But man, was I worshiping. I love contemporary worship. It touches me deep within my soul. Because the focus is not on the music, not on the worship team, but on God. I have been... In Mexico villages up in La Pietra, little tiny hole in the wall place, the pastor's son was the musician. He had a five string guitar with three strings and had no idea how to tune them. They killed a rat right before we went into worship in the building with holes in the ceiling with the rain dripping in on us as we're worshiping, and we worship in Spanish. No idea what was being sung. So out of tune, I could barely stand it, but my spirit was worshiping because we were focused upon God. 
worship in Addis Ababa. Two and a half hour service, they're closer to this eternity worship than we are. <clears throat> and in that service, the pastor wore robes and he chanted the liturgy. He should not have received a license to chant the liturgy. It was painful. The guy playing keyboard must have started learning how to play keyboard that morning. It was awful. And yet, we were worshiping powerfully because the focus was upon God. I love all these forms of worship. We need to gain this eternal perspective as we worship. That our focus, our spirit, is focusing upon God. Did you know that this word in Greek for worship has a second meaning? And the second meaning is this, service. Worship and service are the same word in Greek. So who's in charge of worship? God is. And we come as servants, as slaves, to worship him. And our worship isn't just here. Our worship goes right out the doors and, and impacts the way that we interact with other people in the name of Jesus Christ. There is no separation of the two. They are the same thing. We will be spending all of eternity serving our God, worshiping our God. We need to start doing it right here, right now. Revelation 19 is powerful. After this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude to heaven shouting Alleluia, salvation and glory and power belong to our God for true and just are his judgments. <clears throat> Is Bill, yeah, Bill's here. You remember when we went to the Metrodome for a Promise Keeper event? And <clears throat> it was my first Promise Keeper event. There was four of us that went. And there was a moment that they wanted to recognize the pastors. And so <clears throat> they had all the pastors go down onto the field in the Metrodome. So we're standing there. And then they had 70,000 men yell for pastors. I have never heard volume like that my entire life. I was weeping to hear cheers, undeserved, by the way, cheers for the church leadership. I read this passage and I know what that volume could sound like. I, I, if, if a game is like that, Zach, Zach, I don't know how you play football. If that's the volume that is down there, how can you hear anything? It was just intense. It goes on. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Guys, if you're here in worship and you got your hand in your pocket and you're not singing and you think you're, you know, you're, you're, you're not a great singer or you're not exactly sure you want to engage, guess what? You are to worship God. You are to make a noise to God like a loud rushing waters. What we hear down at Lincoln in the stadium should be echoing here because we're talking about God, not the Cornhuskers. All right, I'm done with that. Question, will we be reunited with loved ones in heaven? 1 Thessalonians 4. We don't want you to be uninformed. We want you to know what's going on, brothers, about those who are asleep, those who have died. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring him those who have fallen asleep. For thus we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not proceed to those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, 
and the dead in Christ will rise first? The answer is yes. We will be reunited with loved ones in heaven. I've had an experience to me that verifies it. I was with a family who had a loved one who was passing away. And it was one of those interesting situations that the, we, knew, we knew death was coming upon this individual, and yet he was very coherent. And his wife and kids were in the room with me. He knew all of us. He carried on conversations with us, uh, was, was solid in his talking. I mean, there was nothing weird that he was saying to us. But then at the same time, you know how I said my dad was kind of in two places at once? This is what was going on with him too. Just as he was talking to us in the room, he was talking to his brothers who had died 15 years ago. And he was talking to them just like he was talking to us. For him, we were both in the room at the exact same time. He knew who they were and carried on a conversation with them. I mean, that happened. i got to do something with that. So it makes sense as I reflect upon this passage and reflect upon that experience. So we will run into loved ones in heaven. Question, what about meeting in heaven those we didn't love? Ooh. Now there's this, this poem uh, that talks about how, you know, you, you go to heaven and you're just shocked at the people that are in heaven. You can't believe that so-and-so got into heaven. The poem goes on and on and on. And the last line is, suddenly you recognize they are shocked to see you there as well. <laughs> Psalm 23. We hear that David says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. The question is, is that vindication where you're sitting at table going na 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 to those enemies around you? Or is it reconciliation where you are sitting at table with enemies? A sign of being brought together. I think it's the latter. That, that makes a whole lot more sense to me. There's this, uh, this story. It's, it's totally fictitious, but it's a great illustration of the difference between heaven and hell. And the, the premise is that, that when you die and in the afterlife, you eat. I don't know. You can look that up and see if you eat in the afterlife or not. But, but the premise is that everyone's elbows become uh, locked in place. And so you, you can't feed yourself because your elbows are locked, right? And so in hell, everyone is lamenting and screaming in torment because of the anguish of not being able to eat and the hunger pangs are intense. And in heaven, you don't hear that weeping and gnashing because everyone is feeding each other. I don't know. It's a good illustration that represents the character and the heart of those who are saved. Question. What about my baby that died before it was baptized? I want to start by saying God is judge, not us. And second, I want to say baptism is not a ticket to heaven. Baptism is done as a command from Christ that we are to baptize. And that by baptizing, we pray for God's spirit to move in the life of that individual and to deepen their relationship forever. I cannot, in any part of my being, believe that God automatically condemns a child to hell because they've not been baptized. Think about it. Imagine if a, a family has a birth and it's a traumatic birth <clears throat> it doesn't look like the child is going to live, and they call Pastor Megard, and they want him to come to the hospital 
to baptize the child. And they don't want anybody else to baptize. They want Pastor Megard to baptize. And because Pastor Megard is such a law-abiding individual who never speeds, he drives the speed limit all the way to the hospital. And because he drove the speed limit to the hospital, it took him longer to get there than had he speeded. He shows up, and the child has already died. You can never convince me that because he drove the speed limit, that child is now condemned to hell. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. God is the judge on those matters, not us. Question? What about my uncle? <coughs> Excuse me. What about my uncle that committed suicide? I know that there has been a teaching in the church that suicide is unforgivable. And the logic behind it is this, that they are taking a life, <clears throat> and because it's their life that they're taking, they never have a chance to repent of that particular taking of their own life. I come at it from a totally different way. I come at it from a scriptural perspective, not man-made understanding or logic. And when I have been asked to preach at funerals of individuals that committed suicide without any doubt, I mean, it was clear that they committed suicide. The passage I go to every single time is the words of Jesus from the cross. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they know not what they do. For a person to reach the point of taking their own life, I think that the despair, the depression, uh, the, the, the emotions have to be so overwhelming that they are not thinking clearly at all. Not, not understanding the, the depth of what they are considering to do. Again, God is judge, not us. So, this sermon is done. Is the topic completed? Not even close. So, I found some books that I might encourage you to take a look at. Um, for those of you that are really scientific and really heady, and you just love to challenge and and you might go, well, you know, I know the Bible says this, but are there other things in, in life that just kind of verify it? This book, Life After Death, The Evidence by Dinesh D'Souza, is your book. I read it. I got to admit, I didn't understand half of it because it was way over my little piddly brain head. If you're kind of a bullet point person and you just want the facts, ma'am, here's a great book, uh, Prepared to Answer by Rob Van De Wey. Uh, part of this book, he focuses upon life after death. If you're a narrative type person and you just love uh, flowing through flower language and you want some scriptural basis, uh, this book called Heaven by Randy Alcorn, uh, I'd highly in, uh, recommend you reading. This one is just crazy because uh, Gunnar Nyholm came into my office this week and said, have you read this book? And I said, no, but I'm preaching on this topic Sunday. So it's like, God appointed Gunner to bring me this resource. It's really, really good. If you're a parent or grandparent, aunt or uncle, and you want to help kids uh, understand, here's a great book called Someday Heaven by Larry Libby. Um, it really is put on a kid's level and gives some scriptural basis and helps uh, kids understand what the scripture has to say. Also, a couple other books, Heaven is for Real uh, by... Uh, Todd Burpo, he talks about his four-year-old son who had a ruptured appendicitis, died, happened right here in Nebraska, and his experiences of, of uh, being in heaven, and then he was resuscitated and came back. Another book similar to that is 90 Minutes in Heaven by Don Piper, which is really good. And then one that I really encourage all of you to read, uh, it's called The Holy Bible, written by God. Uh, it's a great resource to find out all the answers to all your questions. So, that's what I want you to do. I want you to think about this topic. And, and I know you got more questions. I know you're, 
maybe struggling with things. There might be part of this sermon that really ticked you off this morning. I don't know. Um, but I want you to email me with your questions. I want you to call me. Maybe if it's a lengthy conversation, let's go have coffee and sit down and, and talk about this thing called life after death. And, and, and through it, come to a deeper understanding that, you know, the promise for us is an eternal one. A couple weeks ago, we heard St. Paul say that if our hope in Christ is just for this life, just for this world, if that is our hope in Christ, is just here, then we are most of all to be pitied. Our hope in Christ, our confidence in Christ, is for all of eternity and takes us into life after death. My dad, the night he died, and I know some of you have heard this before too, I'm sorry, but I don't care. It's good for my soul to tell these stories. The principal up in Creighton, they were down in Omaha, he was up in Creighton. My mom was a school teacher for 43 years up there. He woke up at 2.30 in the morning in a cold sweat, <clears throat> and his wife asked, what's wrong? And he said, I had the weirdest dream about Max Tyler. She said, well, what did you dream? He said, I dreamed that Max was walking down Main Street in Creighton, and he was waving at everybody, big smile on his face, shaking hands with people, talking with people. Remember I told you my dad couldn't talk toward the end? And, and he just walked down the street, just having a grand time, got to the end of the street, turned around, and waved, turned, and walked up a, a stair and disappeared into the clouds. That was the night my dad died. What do I do with that? <laughs> I believe God gave another glimpse and verified the fact of life after death to let my family know it's okay. It's okay. Amen.